get they can give me eight years that was suspended, you know, and I my 20 years is not up. I'm still on the hook for that. So if I was ever getting trouble, they could go back and give me those eight years that they suspended. So do they really not like think? And 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 I think the proof is in the pudding, you know, people like myself or Tara. Or even, um, you know, there's a, there's Oscar, Oscar who like did the barber school. And now he's like, lives in the Valley. He's doing really well. And you have like, uh, John Woodard. Yeah. All those individuals, we should be, they be, they should be like, oh my gosh, we really want your help. And you know, that's what the VIP program was for in the first place. And, um, they took it all away and I just don't understand it. I thought that maybe we were getting somewhere and things. I was actually really surprised and shocked that Bill was doing um, what Pennsylvania is doing right now, where they put a stove in the, in the pod. And, you know, the remember that black guy, he was sitting there saying, I had stromboli in the oven and I had pan pancakes with bananas and it was delicious. And, he was even afraid to even open up the oven. He's like, can I open it and look at it? It's like you take any form of normalcy away and you make, you create an environment that's animalistic. How do you think people are going to react? You don't want to take that away. You want their, their reality, you know, their reality and their situation to be the same as it was on the outside as far as like, but being sober and having mentors rather than uh creating a, an environment that makes somebody hostile and pissed off because i've had inmates tell me that in their mind they had plotted to kidnap certain officers and uh hurt them for the things that they had done and i don't think that people really like understand you know the magnitude of uh the chaos and um anger that's created in somebody that has time in their head time in their head and um, trying to build up um, an action of revenge for things that were done to them while they're in prison, you know? So it's like, it's a win-win if you're like doing things that are beneficial to, and, and not just that it's beneficial to the officer because their stress reduct, their stress level and their environment is reduced. They're not on constant, like, Oh my gosh, I got to like be on defense because, I'm an officer and they're all out to get me, you know? Yes. Is there manipulative inmates? Absolutely. I've come across so many, <laughs> you know, is there ones that don't want to change? Absolutely. Okay. We'll do what the Norwegian countries do. If you don't want to change and participate in programs, then you can stay in your room. Exactly. Exactly. You can stay, you can stay in your room and, do your thing, but everybody else that's going to be participating in programs and, you know, job training and treatment and counseling and, you know, trauma therapy and um, parenting classes and all that, they're going to be out here doing what they're supposed to be doing, but you can stay in your room and be on, you know, watch your TV or whatever, but pretty soon they're going to be like, oh my God, I got to get out of this room. Okay. I'm going to succumb. I'm going to like conform to it. And eventually, once they start doing it, there's a term in treatment that's saying act as if, you know, or live as if you live as if even if you don't feel it pretty soon after you're living like that and acting like that, it's not an act anymore. And you're actually living what you've been practicing. And then you're like, oh, my God, I love this. And, you know, it becomes natural to you. No, exactly. And how. How did we get to where if you go to a lot of the prisons, especially down in the States, um, you, if you're black, you, you're going to go be with the black guys. If you're white, that's who you better hang out with. You know, where did that start? Well, that all started with, they come in. That's how it is. If you have an environment where you come in and you're actually the odd person out, if you're not involved in programs, if you're not, oh man, you don't get to cook your own dinner. That must kind of suck. We do over here, but hey, enjoy <laughs> yeah. what you made. You know all of that stuff. Um, yeah, you people people do become what their environment. It's you treat them like animals. It's I have to say. 
even more kudos to Carl because not only was he fighting his peers in the sense of taking a different path and not just staying in with, you know, the people that, you know, involved in the games and stuff like that. But I know, I know that he had to fight staff and DOC in what is that word? Uh, DOC, um, just that environment, the, what, the ideology that's there. So to get to, to have to be like, I need to go to our set. I need to go to, I need to go to, and to be, no, no. How silly, how silly. I need help. No, no, I, I want to change. Yeah, whatever. That's crazy to me. And yet that is yeah. just, that is of most prisons that's the lay of that's the layout. Not only are you fighting going against the grain of your peers, you're also going against the grain of what most officers are going to think of you. And they think you're just taking this class because, like you said, it's six months to get to the door and you want to get out earlier or whatever it is. And um, yeah, so that says a lot. And then for him, yes, to take the extra year, who does that? The only, people that ever, the only people I've ever seen want to stay in prison are the people that have absolutely nothing. They're homeless. They have some mental instability. And so they start to think of, okay, this is, this is where I can get food and heat and stuff. But most people, they're like, open that door. I'm out of here. I'll figure something out. And, uh, yeah, for him to be like, I, I need to learn this. That's, that's incredible. I'm curious, how was your experience? How are you treated when you were in prison? Did you feel like, <laughs> I know, I kind of know the answer, but um, hearing it from you, actually, uh, did you have any officers that were, you know, wanting to help you out? Um, or did you pretty much feel like you were a piece of shit on their shoe? Um, for the most part, most officers, you know, my crime, uh, I was convicted of giving drugs to a minor. So I was basically in the same category as somebody as the child abuser and stuff like that. And so, um, obviously I wasn't very well liked. And then I also bucked the system while I was in there, when I saw things that weren't right, I quickly like learned, okay, this is, they're violating our rights here. And so I was always grieving, you know, I filed a complaint with the courts, 22 page complaint saying, you know, that we're basically, you know, the level system, the RSAT program was like so abusive and mentally, you know, just not, it doesn't, it's like harmful to people that have trauma. You know, I did all these things and so, um, you know, I had a lot of pushback, but I also had officers that would secretly pull me aside. And I remember one specific officer pulled me aside and she pulled me in the office and she was like, she goes, you know, I really think that what you did is great because, you know, I have a thumb drive of stuff that I've saved over the years um, of things that I thought were just absolutely wrong you know she talked about you know a woman native woman that was in labor and they put her in solitary rather than taking her to hospital her baby died in solitary you know just stuff like that and you know she was hoping that some changes would happen um and when they found out she was talking to me they put her in they took her out of the house that she was working in and they put her in solitary confinement and so she became a solitary confinement officer and then you had, then I went to, to the, the program house and then you had, I remember um, two specific officers that I really had a lot of respect for in that house, but then there was other officers. And I think the ones that I really like thought that was really awesome was um, the ones that were that I saw that when they say they believed in God and they were Christian and that, but then they showed it in their actions. That's when I 
that's when I was like, okay, this guy's, this person is genuine. Um, one specific officer that I thought was really great was Sergeant McCafferty. He's a native guy and he did the beauty for ashes thing. And he shared his own personal story of being sexually abused as a child in the village. And, and then he did all those programs, but then he also was just extremely nice when it came to like understanding what trauma does to people. And he many times had to talk me out of my room when I was having moments of like traumatic experiences that I was experiencing in this RSAT program that I was just like, oh my God, this is triggering things in me. And he was super gentle, like super gentle and super nice. And I think that it was okay for him to be that way because he was working in the program house because all the officers there were like pretty much, you know, um, you know, cool. And then you had the officers that would, that were in between. They didn't like the stuff that was going on, but they didn't get involved. You know, they didn't really want to rock the boat. And so they were like neutral and they just came to work and did their job and they were nice to you, but they didn't like, you know, be too nice because they didn't want to come off as, you know, an inmate lover or hug a thug. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hug a thug. Hug a thug. I haven't heard that for a while. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, I, I had, you know, and then also I, I wasn't very well liked by the inmates. So I think my, me experience the things that I experienced um, with, you know, when I was in prison um, really helped me help Carl go through what he was going through because he had a lot of rejection from in cars he went from being royalty to being in his eyes a bitch that's what he would say i'm a sellout and i'm a bitch that's what everybody thinks i am and i'm just like no you're not that's not no you're not you're going to see the benefits of everything the choice that you're making right now and and so people thought the same thing about me because i went to church i became chaplain's assistant i was you know, always in the chaplain's library, I was reading my Bible, I would stay in my room for hours, read books, read my Bible. Um, and then I would listen to worship music while I was, you know, in my classroom. You know, I would always be teaching history classes or holding math classes. So I always stayed out of the mix and didn't get involved with all that stuff. And, and so I was just kind of like labeled one of those individuals that would be like, Oh, it's, uh, she's a Christian, uh, Jesus for the stay. And then when you hit the strip out room, you leave Jesus in the strip out room. And I was, and I can understand that, but I wasn't like that. I didn't leave him in there. I was just like, totally took him with me when I walked out the door, you know? So, um, and I still had my traumas that I had to work through. So you know, I dealt with some stuff in RSAT. And then I also dealt with some stuff when I went to the TLC program, I advocated to get that for the women there. And eventually, after two and a half years of chasing the chaplain down, they finally got a, a program for the women. Um, and uh, I was the first woman to graduate RSAT and TLC back to back. So that was pretty um, amazing. Um, but I learned a lot in the TLC and that I understood that uh, what I did learn is that I had a lot of trauma and, and I still do. I still have to work through this, like belief about myself of understanding that I have worth and that um, I still need to help have those walls break down those walls of like being worthy and accepting love from people. Like I can give it out, but, I've been alone my whole life and it's like super hard. Like I've been passed from, you know, institutions to foster care to all these things. And so I didn't have a sense of understanding and no true love in my, my own home growing up. And so that whole idea of like accepting that, that was something I struggled with in prison and my chaplain would tell me that all the time. And then, uh, and then I still struggle with it to this day. And you know, I'm hoping that my husband can like, yeah, I have insecurities. I tell him all the time. I have insecurities um, about you loving me, you know, like in my mind, I'm like, do I even deserve that? You know, I know I do, but like, I have this wall up where I'm just like, 
you know, how do I accept what you believe that I'm deserving of? And even learning that with my in-laws, like I have in-laws that are like totally sane and like normal people. And I'm like, okay, how am I going to like accept the love that they're giving me? You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm not perfect. I still a little do lally tap up here. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, uh, we have, I, I just looked up and realized that we've been going for like two hours and I, <laughs> there is so much more. I feel like that we could go into just that topic alone. Um, but then there's more to, you know, with DOC, with just all kind of with Carl, with, you know, still the murder of your son, just all of that stuff. So yeah, this has been awesome. I want to tell you, I really, really, really appreciate you coming on and, and letting me interview you. And I would love to be able to talk to you again. Um, this has been yeah. amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and we will wrap this up. But uh, yeah, thank you so, so much for being yeah, on here. Absolutely. I, I did want to know, is there um, one or two or however many, uh, I want to say organizations, but um, things, uh, I guess organizations that you work with right now? Are you, are you working with different? Um, well, one in particular is the Northern Justice Project. I, there are civil rights attorneys and stuff like that, because I believe that th I am working with them on several things um, for the civil rights of people incarcerated uh, specifically um, and to advocate for mostly to focus on rehabilitation efforts of people incarcerated. Okay. Um, and so that's just the one organization as far as every other ones I've kind of like, I've had to take a break a little bit because um, I was like in an overwhelmed state. I'm working on top of like trying to navigate all the things that I want to do. Um, but I'm believing that God's going to open that door and I just need to not push it, you know? So um, I just been praying about it a lot. Let's just say that. And so I stepped back a little bit from everything and taking a break and like regrouping and, uh, you know, spending time with my daughter, getting to know her uh, better because we didn't have a very strong relationship. And for eight years, I didn't see her. And so, you know, um, just really trying to focus on building a future for Carl when he gets out and stuff. So what was the name of that again? Because I want to what I'll do is I'll put a link to that in the description of the video so yes. that people can go to it and check it out. Yeah, it's Northern Justice Project. They're okay. civil rights attorneys. Um, and they focus on, you know, the civil rights of individuals. And so the recent um, class action that we filed was the, against the Curis to, hmm. to, um, to stop having to make family members pay for the Securus phone calls and to make them affordable, according to the Clery Act. And so... We're both, when we bring things to the table, we're looking at the laws that are currently in place. And we're also looking at things right now that we're seeing that's being violated and nobody's, they're just intentionally violating them. And no matter how much we say it, they're still going to continue to do it. And so we're working on trying to file some more um, complaints um, to force their hand to adhere to what the laws say. And so either change their policy or we're going to have to take it legal. So it's called the Northern justice project and um, they're great group of attorneys. So awesome. Cool. Well, again, I totally appreciate you being here and um, yeah, I look so forward to talking to you again. Again, it was uh, Terry Van and Herc and super appreciative. I yeah, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Okay.